the Lancashire Witches, the revelation. On quitting the long gallery, Mistress Nutter and Alison ascended a wide staircase and, traversing a corridor, came to an antique tapestry chamber, richly but cumbrously furnished, having a carved oak bedstead with sombre hangings, a few high back chairs of the same material, and a massive wardrobe with shrine work at all, and two finely sculptured figures of the size of life in the habits of sisters, and monks placed as supporters at either extremity. At one side of the bed the tapestry was drawn aside, showing the entrance to a closet or inner room, and opposite it there was a great yawning fireplace with a lofty mantelpiece and chimney projecting beyond the wall. The windows were narrow and darkened by heavy transom bars and small diamond panes, while the view without, looking upon Wally Nab, was obstructed by the contiguity of a tall cypress whose funeral branches added to the general gloom. The room was one of those formerly allotted to their guests by the hospitable abbots and had undergone little change since that time, except in regard to furniture, and even that appeared old and faded now. What with the gloomy arras, the shrouded bedstead, and the gothic wardrobe with its mysterious figures, the chamber had a grim ghostly air, and so the young girl fought on entering it. I have brought you hither, Alison, said Mistress Nutter, motioning her to a seat, that we may converse without chance of interruption, for I have much to say on first seeing you day your appearance so superior to the rest of the mayday mummers struck me forcibly and i resolved question elizabeth device about you accordingly i bade her join me in the abbey gardens she did so and had not long left me when i accidentally met you and others in the lacy chapel when questioned elizabeth abetted great surprise and denied positively that there was any foundation for the idea that you were other than her child but notwithstanding her asseverations i could see from her confused manner that there was more in the notion than she chose to admit, and I determined to have recourse to other means of arriving at truth, little expecting my suspicions would be so soon confirmed by Mother Chatter. To my interrogation of that old woman, you were yourself a party, and I am now rejoiced that you interfered to prevent me from prosecuting my inquiries to the utmost. There was one present from whom the secret of your birth must be strictly kept at least for a while, and my impatience carried me too far. I only obeyed a natural impulse, madam, said Alison, but I am at a loss to see what claim I can possibly have to the consideration you show me. Listen to me and you shall learn, replied Mistress It is a sad tale and its recital will tear up an old wound, but it must not be withheld on that account. I do not ask you to bury the secrets I am about to impart in the recesses of your bosom. You will do so when you learn them, without my telling you. When little more than your age I was wedded, but not to him I would have chosen, if choice had been permitted me. The union I need scarcely say was unhappy, most unhappy. Though my discomforts were scrupulously concealed and I was looked on as a devoted wife, and my husband as a model of conjugal affection. But this was merely the surface. Internally all was strife and misery. Here long my dislike to my husband increased to absolute hate, while on his part though he still regarded me with as much passion as heretofore. He became frantically jealous and above all of Edward Raddle of Hortfield, who as his boss and friend and my distant relative was frequent visitor to relate the numerous exhibitions of jealousy that occurred would answer little purpose, and it will be enough to say that not word or look as between Edward and myself was it was misconstrued. I took care never to be alone without guests, nor to give any just grounds of suspicion, but my caution availed nothing. An easy remedy would have been to forbid Edward the house. This my husband's pride rejected. He preferred to endure the jealous torment occasioned by the presence of his wife's fancied lover and inflict needless anguish on her. Rather than brook the tears of a few indifferent acquaintances, the same feeling made him desire to keep up an apparent good understanding with me. And so far I seconded his views, for I share in his pride if in nothing else our quarrels were all in private, when no eye could see us, no ear listen. Yours is a melancholy history, madam, remarked Alison in a tone of profound interest. You will think so ere I have done, returned the lady, sadly. The only person in my confidence and aware of my secret sorrow was Elizabeth Device, who, with her husband John Device, then lived at Rookley, serving me in the quality of tire woman and personal attendant. She could not be kept in ignorance of what place, and the poor soul offered me all the sympathy in her power. Much was it needed, for I had no other sympathy. After a while, I know not what was, unless from some imprudence on the part of Edward Raddle, who was wild and reckless, my husband conceived worse suspicions than ever of me, and began to treat me with harshness and cruelty. That unable longer to endure his violence, I appealed to my father, but he was of a stern and arbitrary nature, and having forced me into the 
Marsh would not listen to Mangley and bade me submit it was my duty to so he said and he added some cutting expressions to the effect that I deserved treatment I experienced and dismissed me. Driven to desperation I sought counsel and assistance from one I should most have avoided from Edward Braddle and he paused flight from my husband's roof flight with him but you were saved madam cried Alison greatly shocked by the narrative you were saved he and me out to join Mr. Hunter outraged this my feelings were and loathsome as my husband was to me I spurned the base proposal and instantly quitted my false friend nor would I have seen him more if permitted but that secret interview with him was my first and last for it had been witnessed by my husband ha exclaimed Alison concealed behind the horrors Richard Nutter heard enough to confirm his worst suspicions pursued the lady but he did not hear my justification he saw Ed Raddle at my feet he heard him urge me to fly but he did not wait to learn if I consented and looking upon me as guilty left his hiding place to take measures for frustrating the planning clause concerted between us that night I was made prisoner in my room and endured treatment the most in but a proposal was made by my husband that promised some alleviation of my suffering. Henceforth we were to meet only in public when a semblance of affection was to be maintained on both sides. This was done, he said, to save my character and preserve his own name unspotted in the eyes of others. However tarnished it might be in his own, I willingly consented to the arrangement and thus for a brief space I became tranquil, if not happy, but another and severer trial awaited me. Alas, madam, exclaimed Alison, sympathising left my cup of sorrow I thought was full, assured mistress. But the drop was wanting to make it overflow. He came soon enough and missed my griefs. I expect to be a mother, and with that all, how many fond and cheering anticipations mingled in my child. I hope I find a balm for my wards in his smile and innocent endearments, a compensation for the harshness and injustice I had experienced. How little did I foresee that it was to be a new instrument of torture to me, and that I should be cruelly robbed of the only blessing ever about to save me? Did the child die, madam? asked Alice. You shall hear, replied Mr. The daughter was born to me. I was made happy by its birth a new existence, bright and unclouded scene dawning upon me, but it was like a sunburst on a stormy day. Some two months before this event, Elizabeth Device had given birth to a daughter, and she now took my child under her fostering care, for weakness prevented me from affording the support. It is a mother's less privilege to be sought. She seemed as fond of it as myself, and never was a more calculated to win love than my little Millicent. Oh, how shall I go on? The retrospect I am compelled to take is right, oh, but I cannot shun it. The foul and false suspicions entertained by my my husband began to settle on the child. He would not believe it to be his own. With violent force and press, he first announced his odious suspicions to Elizabeth Device, and she, all terror, communicated them to me. Tidings filled me with inexpressible alarm, for I knew if the dread idea had once taken possession of him, it would never be removed. While what he threatened would be executed, I would have fled at once with my baby if I had known where to go. But I had no place of shelter, it would be in vain to seek refuge with my father, and I had no other relative or friend who I trust. Where then should I fly? At last I bethought me of a retreat and arranged plan of escape with Elizabeth Device. Vain were my cautions. On that very night I was startled from slumber by a sudden cry from the nurse who was seated by the fire with child on her knees. It was long past midnight and all the household were at rest. Two persons had entered the room. One was my ruthless husband Richard Nutter. The other was John Device, a powerful ruffinly fellow who planted himself near the door. Marching quickly towards Elizabeth who had arisen on scene him. My husband snatched the child from her before I could seize it, and with a violent blow on the chest, felled me to the ground, where I lay helpless, speechless, with reeling senses. I heard Elizabeth cry out that it was her own child, and call upon her husband to save it. Richard not paused, but reassured by a laugh disbelief from his ruffianly follower, he told Elizabeth the pitiful excuse would not avail to save the rat, and then I saw a weapon gleam. There was a feeble, piteous cry, a cry that might have moved a demon, but it did not move him. With wicked words and blood and brood hands, he cast the body on the fire. The horrid sigh was too much for me, and I became senseless. A dreadful tale indeed, madam, cried Alison, frozen with horror. The crime was hidden, hidden from the eyes of men, but marked a retribution that followed, said Mistress Sutter, her eyes sparkling with vindictive joy of the two murderers, all perished miserably. John Device was drowned in a moss pool. Richard Nutter's end was terrible, sharpened by the pangs of remorse and marked by frightful suffering. But another dark event preceded his death, which may have laid a crime and mark on his already heavily burdened soul. Edward Bradley the object of his jealousy and hate suddenly sickened of her. My lady, so strange and fearful that all who saw him affirmed it the result of witchcraft. None thought my husband's agency in the dark affair except myself, knowing he had
had held many secret conferences about the time with Mother Chattox, I more than suspected it. The sick man died, and from that hour, Richard Nutter knew no rest. Ever on horseback, obviously carousling, he sought in vain to strive for remorse. Visions scared him by night, and big ears pursued him by day. He was sought at shadows at all while that to me his old demeanour was altered, and he strove by every means in his power to win my love, but he could not give me back the treasure he had taken. He could not bring to life my murder babe. Like his victim fell ill on a sudden and of a strange and terrible sick. I saw he could not recover and therefore tended him carefully. He died and I shed no tear. Alas, exclaimed Alison, though guilty. I cannot be compassionate him. You are right to do so, Alison, said Mistress Nutter, rising while the young girl rose too, for he was your father. My father, she exclaimed in amazement, then you are my mother. I am, I am, replied Mistress Nutter, straining her to her bosom. Oh, my child, my dear child, she cried. The voice of nature from the first pleaded eloquently in your behalf, and I should have been deaf to all impulses of affection if I had not listened to your call. And now trace in every feature the lineaments of a by four lost forever. All is clear to me. The exclamation of Elizabeth Bass, which, like my ruthless husband, I look on as an artifice to save the infant's life, I now find be the truth. Her child perished instead of mine. How or why she exchanged the infants on that night remains to be explained, but that she did so is certain. While that she should afterwards conceal the circumstance is easily comprehended from a natural dread of her own husband as well as of mine. It is possible that from some cause she may still deny the truth, but I can make it her interest to speak plainly. The main difficulty will lie in my public acknowledgement of you, but at whatever cost it shall be made. All consider it well, said Alison, I will be your daughter in love and duty in all but name, but surely not my poor father's honour, which even at the peril of his soul he sought to maintain. How can I be bought as your daughter without involving the discovery of this tragic history? You are right, Alison, rejoined Mistress Nutter, thoughtfully. It will bring the dark deed to light, but you shall never return to Elizabeth Device. You shall go with me to Rugby and take your board in the house where I was once so wretched. But where I shall now be full of happiness with you. You shall see the dark spots on the heath which I took to be your blood. If not mine, it was blood still by my father, said Alison with a shudder. Was it fancy or did a low groan break on her ear? It must be imaginary, but Mistress Nutter seemed unconscious of the dismal sound. It was now growing rapidly dark and the most distant objects in the room were wrapped in obscurity. But Alison's gaze rested on the two monkish figures supporting in the wardrobe. Look there, mother, she said to Mistress Nutter. Where? cried the lady, turning round quickly. Ha, I see. You alarm yourself needlessly, my my child, those are only carved figures of two brethren of the abbey. They are said, I know not with what truth, to be statues of John Paslow and Borlace Avilton. I thought they stirred, said Alison. If I was mere fancy, replied Mistress Nutter, calm yourself, sweet child, let us think of other things, of our newly discovered relationship. Henceforth, to me you are Millicent Nutter, though to others you must still be Alison Device, my sweet Melissa, she cried, embracing her again and again. Ah, little, little did I think to see you more. Alison's fears were steadily chased away. Away. Give me, dear mother, she cried, if I have failed to express the full delight I experienced in my restitution to you. The shock of your sad tale at first deadened my joy with the suddenness of the information, setting myself so overwhelmed me that, like one chance upon a hidden treasure and gazing at the confounded, I was able to credit my own fortune. Even now I am quite bewildered, and no wonder for many thoughts, each different import sprung upon me, independently of the pleasure and natural pride I must feel in being acknowledged by you as a daughter. It is a source of deepest satisfaction to me to know that I am not in any way connected with Elizabeth Device, not from her humble station or haughty ways, little with me in comparison with virtue and goodness. But from her sinfulness, you know the dark events laid to her charge. I do, replied Mistress Nutter in a lordy tone, but I do not believe it, nor I, returned Alison. Still, she acts as if she were the wicked thing she is called, avoids all religious offices, shuns all places of worship, and derides the holy scriptures. Oh, mother, you will comprehend the frequent conflict feelings I must have endured. You will understand my horror when I have sometimes thought myself daughter of a witch. Why did you not leave her if you also said Mistress Nutter frowning? I could not leave her, replied Alison, but I then thought her my mother. Mistress Nutter fell upon her daughter's neck and wept aloud. You have an excellent heart, my child, she said, and then checking her emotion. I have nothing to complain of in Elizabeth Device, dear mother, she replied. What she denied herself, she did not use me. Yet. Though I have necessarily many great deficiencies, you may find in me a personal evil and souls. Or oh, shall we not try to rescue that or benign the creature from the pain we may yet save her? It is too late, replied Mistress Nutter. It cannot be too late, said Alison confidently. She cannot be beyond redemption, but even if she should prove intractable, poor little Janet may be preserved. She is yet a child with some good or alas much evil also in her nature. Let our united efforts be exerted in this good work, and we must see the weeds expated, flowers will spring up freely and bloom in beauty. I can have nothing to do with her, said Mistress Nutter in a reason. 
more, no more shit. Oh, say not so much, cried Alice. You robbed me of all the happiness I feel in being restored to When I was Janet's sister, I devoted myself to the task of reclaiming her. I hope to be her guardian angel to set between her and the assaults of evil, and I cannot, will not now abandon her. If no longer my sister, she is still dear to me, and recollect that I owe a deep debt of gratitude to her mother, a debt I can never pay. How so, cried Mistress Nutter, you owe her nothing but the contrary. I owe her a life, said Alison. Was not her infant blood poured out for mine, and shall I not save the child left her? If I can, I shall not oppose your inclinations, replied Mistress Nutter with reluctant assent. But Elizabeth, I suspect, will thank you little for your interference. Not now, perhaps, returned Alison, but a time will come when she will do so. While this conversation took place, it had been rapidly growing dark, and the gloom at length increased so much that the sea could scarcely see each other's faces. The sudden and tentious darkness was accounted for by a vivid flash of lightning, followed by a low growl of thunder, rumbling over the now. The mother and daughter drew close together, and Mistress Nutter passed her arm round Alison's neck. The storm came quickly on with all and dangerous lightning and loud blasts of thunder, threatening mischief. Presently, all its fury seemed collected over the abbey. The red flashes hissed, and the pearls of thunder rolled over there, but other terrors were added to Alison's natural dread of the elemental warfare. Again, she fancied the two monkish figures, which had before excited her alarm, moved and even shook their arms menacingly at her. At first, she attributed this wild idea to her overwrought imagination and strove to convince herself of its fallacy by keeping her eyes steadily fixed upon them, but each succeeding flash only served to confirm her superstitious apprehensions. Another circumstance contributed to heighten her alarm. Scared most probably by the storm, a large white owl fluttered down to the chimney, and after wheeling twice or thrice round the chamber, settled upon the bed, hooting, puffing, ruffling its feathers, and glaring at her with eyes that glowed like fiery coals. Mistress Nutter seemed a little moved by the storm, though she kept profound silence. But when Alison gazed at her face, she was frightened by its expression, which reminded her of the terrible aspect she had worn at the interview with Mother Chattos. All at once, Mistress Nutter arose, and rapid as the lightning playing around her, and revealing her movements, made several passes with extended hands over her daughter, and on this the latter instantly fell back as if fainted, though still retaining her consciousness. And what was stranger still, though, her eyes were closed, and power of sight remained. In this condition, she fancied invisible storms were moving about her, strange sounds seemed to touch her ears, like gibbering a ghost, and she thought she felt flat in the underseen wings around her. All at once her attention was drawn, she knew not why, towards the closet and out of it she fancied she saw issue the tall dark figure of a man. She was sure she saw him, for her imagination could not body for each charge with such a fiendish expression. Eyes of such early lustre. He was clothed in black, the fashion of his raiment was like all she had ever seen. His stature was gigantic and pale, phosphoric light enshrouded him. As he advanced, thought lightning shot the room, and the hunter slipped overhead. Owl, who to be able to acquit its perch, and flew off by the way of the entrance of the chamber. The dark shape came on, it stood beside Mistress Nutter, and she prostrated herself before it. The gesture of the figure were angry and imperious, those of Mistress Nutter supplicating. Their converse was drowned by the rattling of the storm. At last the figure pointed to Alison, and the word midnight broke in tones louder than the thunder on its lips. All consciousness then forsook her. How long she continued in this state, she knew not, but the touch of her finger applied to her brows seemed to recall her sudden led to animation. She heaved a deep sigh and looked around. A wondrous change had occurred. The storm had passed off, and the moon was shining brightly over the top of the cypress tree, flooding the chamber with its gentle radiance. While her mother was bending over her with looks of tenderest affection, "You are better now, sweet child," said Mistress Nutter. "You were overcome by the storm. It was sudden and terrible, terrible indeed," replied Alison, imperfectly recalling what had passed. "It was not alone the storm that frightened me. This chamber has been invaded by evil beings. Before I beheld a dark figure come from out your closet and stand before you, you have been thrown into." a state of stupor by the influence of the electric fluid, replied Mistress Nutter, and while in that condition, visions have passed through your brain. That is all, my child. Oh, I also said Alison, such ecstasies are of reason to her, replied Mistress Nutter, since you are quite covered, we will send to Lady Ashton. You may wonder at our absence. You will share this room with me tonight, my child, but as I have already said, we cannot return to the Elizabeth device. I will make all full explanations to Lady Ashton, and I will see Elizabeth in the morning. Perhaps tonight, reassure yourself, my child, there will be a choice not more replied Alice, but it will ease my mind to look into that. Do so, then by all means, replied Mrs. Nutter with a forced smile. Alison peeped timorously into the little room, which was lighted up by the moon rays. There was a faded white habit like the robe of a sister and see a monk hanging in one corner, and beneath it an old chest. Alison would fain have opened the chest, but Mrs. Nutter called out to her impatiently. You will discover nothing, I am sure. Home, let us go downstairs.